that you would bless this message today. God, I would, this is so foundational, God. This takes us back 27 years. And so, Lord, I'm asking that this just go deep into our hearts and that there be a renewal today of vision and values and foundations so that we rise, Lord, in power. We rise in your authority and in your grace, Jesus. Amen. God's been making a lot of changes in this place recently, and they're good changes, and they're powerful changes. It's been changes in the heart of this church, and I've seen changes happening in in churches where I've ministered in other states and cities over the, the last months. The sweetness of the Lord's presence has deepened. Hearts have been purified. I've watched this happen. Relationships have been made, and some relationships have been restored that were broken for a long time. But today isn't really about changes. Today is about a return. Today is about coming full circle to finally realize, finally, finally realize the vision God put into my heart more than 27 years ago for what kind of church that we would become. Some of you know the story. Many of you are too new to know the story, but you need to know. So this is gonna be kind of review for some of you, but for others it's gonna be news. The Lord Lord conceived this church, we're gonna get to scripture in a minute, but the Lord conceived this church in my heart in the summer of 1992. And that makes some of us feel old. No. (laughs) Back then, Back then, Beth and I lived in, in, over in Westminster near 100th and Wadsworth in a large home where I set up an office in a corner room in the basement. I was jobless that summer because I had resigned from the megachurch where I'd served as executive pastor for 14 months and I wasn't, I, I, I wasn't certain what we were gonna do or where we were gonna go. I had a family to support. And I, I, I hadn't felt a call to go anywhere. There were possibilities. I didn't know where to go. And I thought, God, when I left Idaho and we came here, have I led my family into a dead end? How am I going to take care of my family? Nothing felt right. It was a scary time. I didn't know what to do. That last month that I was on staff at that church, I traveled to Vermont. I was a featured speaker there for a conference alongside Francis and Judith McNutt and Leonard Lesword. Now, a lot of you aren't old enough to know who they were. But during the heyday of the charismatic renewal that started back in the, uh, the, well, started back in the 60s and lasted through the 80s, they were icons of the charismatic renewal. Everybody knew who they were. They were like fathers of the faith. You know, they were the, they were, the, if I were to draw an analogy, they were the Bill Johnsons and the, and the John Arnotts of that period of, of time. Just giants, everybody knew. Beth and I had just returned from that conference and I was now free of the church that I'd resigned from. I'd gone to Vermont, I'll pick up that story in a moment, but I I had gone to Vermont as a speaker, but it made sense to me to seek out those people who were older and who were wiser than I was at the time for advice for advice about whether I was called to plant a church here in Denver. I didn't. I didn't want to be here. It had not been a happy sojourn. (laughs) I wanted to go somewhere else. And they helped me see, those people helped me see what God wanted, and with their help, God gave me a plan. And then Bob Jones blessed his heart, called me up and said, God called you to plant a church in Denver. And so the plan that got hatched that week in in consultation with those people was that I would take three months to make the decision. There'd be three months to let the dust settle from that resignation from the megachurch so that, you know, I didn't want to draw anybody away from there on a knee-jerk reaction. I didn't want to create a church split. That wasn't in my heart. And so it was three months to pray, just to pray. In the middle of that three months, the plan was that I would start a small meeting for a small group of people by invitation only 
and we would see, I would, I, I, would, I would pour into them whatever vision the Lord would give me, and we would see by the end of that, by the end of about six or seven meetings, whether we were a people. And I told the Lord that I, I, and by the way, when I say by invitation only, there were 12 people, just 12. 12 people who had wanted to know what we were going to do because they knew that I'd resigned. And so we sent an invitation to 12 people. When we started those meetings in the middle of the three months, 70 people showed up. It was a little overwhelming. I told the Lord, if that's the plan, if that's where we're going, then I need a sign. This is such a big decision, because I didn't want to stay in Denver. It's a, and I said, you know, I have a family to take care of. That sign is going to have to be, Lord, that you would provide for me three months. This is like a fleece. You provide for me three months income up front at the rate that I was being salaried at before my resignation while I made the decision. Well, what began to happen at that conference in Vermont was people began to give spontaneously. They, they didn't even know. They just heard the Lord say, give to Lauren and Beth. And so before we left that conference to come home from Vermont, we had one and a half times what I had asked for, spontaneously given without saying a word. It was enough to live on and at the same time buy the things we needed you know, you, you, you don't start a church from nothing. You know, you gotta have a sound system and stuff. So there was enough to, to buy the initial sound system and to, and to get things going. Well, I spent a lot of time in that basement office that summer praying. And I had one of the most wonderful visitations of God I've ever had in my life. I'm sitting in that basement for, for several days. There was, there was just a flowing presence of the Lord that little that you're hearing, we should pray for the, for, for, for the ham radio operator in the neighborhood who's operating at an illegal level of power. That's what that is. So God bless him, okay? But I had this wonderful visitation of the Lord, lasted several days. And it was a time when I knew with every fiber of myself that I was, I was God's son. And that he loved me, it just poured through me. And out of that encounter with God came the values and the purposes that have been the cry of my heart from that day to this. I'm convinced that what the Lord gave me there in that basement office in a corner of that house is what a generation of hungry remnant Christians are crying for now today. He gave me six values and six purposes. And those six things, they grip my heart more deeply now than they did even back then. And I understand them better now than I did back then. I think they're more urgent and more timely now than they were then. Here's number one. Worship. Worship. Not truncated three songs, fluffy sermon, go home. Worship until the presence of God breaks through and God makes himself known in our lives and does some stuff. Amen. Worship. Woo. Above everything else, to seek the presence and the glory of the Lord in worship. Worship is the fountainhead of everything else that we do. Amen. John 4, 23 and 24. An hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. He's not talking about having the right doctrine there. He's talking about the whole heart and the whole spirit thrown into worship without reservation to know his presence. In the mid-1970s, contemporary Christian music was being created. It didn't exist before. It was being created for the first time by musicians who had just recently come out of the world. And they still knew how to speak a musical language that would reach people outside the church. Some of you are too young to know the day when every church everywhere had an organ and a piano. And that was it. 
One of the biggest debates in my father's church was how are we gonna raise the money to replace the organ? <laughs> and it was a big deal. I mean, you only did three hymns of pastoral prayer, a responsive reading, and a sermon. <laughs> and then our generation came along in the early 70s and we, wrote, we just rewrote the whole paradigm. In, invented contemporary Christian music. I was in Calvary, I was at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, where it was all born, and I, the, I, the very first contemporary Christian music group was called Love Song. And I got to hear them do their last concert. They created it. Cutting edge stuff. When I was there in seminary in Southern California, I was there in Southern California, I was attending Fuller Theological Seminary, mid 70s. I was doing that full time, but I had a youth group part time in a church in La Palma, California just a few miles from Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, where that was the epicenter of the Jesus movement at the time. And I took the youth group that I led down to Calvary Chapel on Saturday nights for the concerts. And boy, I want to tell you what, music's what drew people. You had to come an hour early and stand outside wait, waiting to get a seat to get in. So I'd take my youth group down there, Saturday nights. Afterwards, at the end, there'd be an altar call. Somebody'd preach and hundreds of kids would storm the stage to get saved. And then after that, there'd be an afterglow. And it'd be one guy with a guitar sitting on the stage just leading us in an afterglow until 11 o'clock, midnight, didn't matter. And I was able to worship for the first time in my life because the music was a language that my heart understood it was the kind of, it, it, was, it was something I could relate to. It wasn't God of our fathers, you know, that, with everybody holding a hymnal and the little wooden plaque on the wall that says, hymn number 325. It was, and I grew up in the church. I spent my Sunday sitting in the balcony throwing spit wads on the people below. <laughs> So I had to keep myself entertained. And all of a sudden, here's this guy sitting on a guitar playing music, playing worship music. My heart understood. And for the first time in my life, I sensed God's presence in church in that afterglow. It was there that I received the gift of tongues. And there were words of knowledge. And there were healings. It was, go it was, just, it was glorious. First time. I want to tell you, it was the music that drew thousands of young people to Jesus. The preaching only sealed it. It was the music that drove the whole thing. But then in the years that followed, I watched it all get swallowed up in the religious spirit of the church. It was like, hey, musicians, you can't play at the limit of your skill because you're showing off. And so you got to keep it all subdued. And the world quit listening. I quit listening. It was boring. You stand some of that music that was going on back then, you stand that up against Jimi Hendrix and it falls flat. Or Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Or people, we got to be better than the world. That, yeah, that, see, I got one amen out of that. Shouldn't we be better than the world artistically? We serve the creator of the universe. And then I, I, I watched contemporary Christian music turn inward and, until it wasn't cutting edge anymore and it stopped reaching the world. The world wouldn't listen. It had been a tool for drawing thousands into the kingdom of God, but all that got lost when we lost focus. I longed for the day when Christian music would be cutting edge again and unbelieving hearts would want to hear it, and they would sense the presence of God in it, so it would play a key role in drawing people to him again. That's been my dream. And I set a course for myself. Father God called me to create, called me to write, not necessarily a better stream of music, but to seek to create the best I could and to bring that alongside what was already being done. And since then, I've seen a resurgence of creativity in Christian music. I see the beginning, just the beginning of a renewal of Christian music reaching the masses. 
But back then it wasn't happening. And I'll register a complaint. I just read this. I'm going to blame this on Dr. Michael Brown, famous guy. I just read an article by him. He's frustrated because he says all of a sudden now Christian music's all beginning to sound, the worship music's all beginning to sound the same, and it never rises past a certain level. He says, where's all the rowdy tap your foot, clap your hands stuff? I'll tell you this morning, you can, take the, you can take the boy out of the rock and roll, but you can't take the rock and roll out of the boy. Amen. <laughs> in my heart, it had to be music. This is what's in my heart. I'm not telling you I got there. I'm telling you I'm trying, but it had to be music that would pass on the street. It had to be music that, that an unbeliever could be moved by because it would speak his language. In its uniqueness and its style, it would speak his language. Even the words would have to be artful and poetic and not full of cliches so the outsider could hear and understand and be moved. A number of years ago, I saw somebody say, here's how you write a Christian song. You, you do three columns. Mm-hmm. Column is I, we. Second column is praise, adore, fall down, raise my hands. And the third column... And the third column is you, God, Father, and you just draw a line through them and you got Christian lyrics. No, that, that was, it was an article I saw written by a musician who was complaining. <laughs> we need to be writing the best poetry in the world and writing it into our music. And so worship, creative worship has always been and will always be a passion here in this church. I will never compromise that. In spirit and in truth, we seek the presence of the Lord, not just for the church, but for the sake of those who are outside. Here's the second one the Lord poured into my heart. The accurate and consistent teaching of the scriptures as the basis for faith, for life, and for practice. And never to compromise that, never to water it down just to cater to the culture around us. I'm not interested in catering to the culture around us. I'm interested in pleasing my God. Jesus didn't call us to put, Jesus didn't call us to grow the church, he called us to make disciples, there's a difference. Not interested in just putting butts in the seats. I'm interested in communicating what God has to say. Never compromise that. Everything that we do here has to pass the test of the word of God. Whether that's ministry methods or how we approach prayer, what we pray about, what we think about God, what we think about demons, what we think about people, what we think about relationships, The word of God has to govern hearing from God. It has to govern prophesying. It has to govern what ministries we choose to do, how we choose to do those ministries. It's the word of God. That's our commitment. The word of God determines how we define our experiences that we have in the Lord. And I want to say, the word defines our experience. We're not going to have experiences and then interpret the scriptures by those experiences We interpret our experiences by the scripture. And we don't just accept at face value everything being said in the body of Christ around us. We're not gonna do that. No matter what important person might be saying it, we're gonna test, we're gonna examine, we're gonna accept only that which passes the test of the word of God. It's in the scriptures We see the love of Father God. We see the love of Father God on every page, in every line, the cross and the resurrection of Jesus undergirding all of it, telling us who he is, who he is in his sacrifice, who he is in his resurrection, how reality actually works as he calls us to be transformed into his image. My heart grieves. I see so many leaders across this country compromising God's word in order to make peace with the culture. I won't make peace with this culture. That's to make peace with demons. How reality actually works as he transforms us into his image. 
And so the Bible is the final, the infallible foundation and definition of our relationship with God and one another, and we teach from it, we study it, and we feed on it. Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Jesus said, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. I wanna give a warning if this country doesn't start listening to the word of God and building our culture upon the word of God, we are looking at the imminent collapse of a once great culture. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house (coughs) and it fell and great was its fall. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture, I want you to understand, all scripture, they were referring to the Old Testament, they didn't have a New Testament yet. You got that, right? Don't let anybody tell you that somehow Jesus set aside the Old Testament. It stands. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Here's the third thing the Lord gave me. Ministries of mercy and compassion. This church would be a church with ministries, lots of ministries, of mercy and compassion for anybody in need of mercy and compassion, no matter who they are. The ultimate gifts of mercy and compassion from a loving God to us were the cross, the resurrection, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. We're called to give those gifts away. Scripture says to minister to Jesus, I want you to catch this, minister to Jesus by feeding the hungry and clothing the naked. And I'll challenge you to go look up where he says that and you will find that's a salvation issue. If you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. These will be cast into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Minister to Jesus by feeding the hungry and clothing the naked. He sent us out to heal the sick. He sent us out to cast out demons. So we've developed ministries over the years to minister to people in every aspect of life. Spiritual growth, marriage, family, healing wounds in the heart, miraculous healing for the physical body, addictions, dysfunctions, finances, and a whole lot more. Better servants of the Lord than I am have called me an apostle of love, and I, you know, that's kind of a highfalutin title. Heidi Baker said it, I didn't, so there it is. But that's my heart. That's real love. Genuine love and compassion have always been the heart of what drives me as a pastor from day one. I can't tell you that I've always been pure in that, But the Lord has dealt pretty strictly with me over the years to keep it pure when I've polluted it with ambition or some other thing that's alien to it. But that was the foundation. That was the core of me and what I wanted to see. It's love that's rooted in the cross and the blood of Jesus. It's his compassion. It's his mercy. It's his grace. It's his sacrifice for the worst of sinners. John 3, 16, you all know this. I ought to be able to quote it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved. So first I set a goal. I made a commitment that we would be a place where the love of the Father would not just be talked about but it would be experienced. It would be the very air we breathe. It would be the atmosphere that people walk into when they enter our doors. 
And it would show us, it, 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 it would be shown in our attitudes towards sinners. It is shown in, in how we speak of and how we treat one another day to day. It would show itself in the acceptance and the grace that we give people when they fail, when they fall short, when they don't measure up or meet the mark in whatever ministry they've chosen or just in life in general or how they relate to us. It would show itself in, in how we relate to one another. I almost called us Mercy Church, but that sounded too much like a hospital. Seriously. Seriously. If you want to say, oh, the church is a hospital, well, then you got to be sick to belong. And if you get well, you got to find something else to be sick about so you can belong. And I didn't want to create that kind of atmosphere. We would have a hospital, but we would not be a hospital because we don't want to have to be sick to belong. One of the things I had to say early on, because my last name is Sanford, my parents pioneered inner healing, was a lot of people came looking for inner healing at New Song, and, and that was going to be the definition of it, and they wanted me to hold their hand and, and you know, be taken care of, and they didn't want to relate to each other. Nobody wanted to rise to a ministry, and I finally had to say, look, <laughs> we are a starship enterprise. Our mission is to boldly go where no one has gone before. We have a sick bay. The sick bay is not the mission. Sick bay is there so that you can get well without having to leave the mission. Amen. Yeah? But it's not the mission. So I wanted a place of healing, but I wanted a place also where, where healthy spirituality could grow and, and people could realize their purpose in the Lord. Romans 12, 9 through 21. Listen to the passion in this. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence. People love takes diligence. It never happens by accident. Fervent in spirit. People call up the passion. Say, I don't feel the passion. Well, choose it. Life's built out of choices. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Here's 12, rejoicing in hope. Persevering in tribulation. You know, when you determine to love, trials are gonna come and you're gonna have to choose to stay with it. I don't think I've ever had a relationship that was easy all the time. And so you work it through. Devoted to prayer. You know what I've learned? You, you won't maintain love anywhere without constant prayer to sustain it. Because it's not in us. Verse 13, contributing to the needs of the saints. Practicing hospitality. I'll translate that this way. Put your money where your mouth is. <laughs> Verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Who have you been hurt by? Is that a reason to become bitter or an occasion to return blessing? Bless and do not curse, he says. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not, boy, that one, that one touches me. It's uh, I've seen a lot of nice churches where everybody looks the same, dresses the same, and occupies the same economic stratum. You understand what I'm saying? That ain't us. <laughs> That's never been us. Associate with the lowly. We'll do that. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. And what I think is, we're not looking for the opinions of men to decide what's right. We're respecting what's right in a way that other men can see. You caught that, right? I'm not letting other men tell me what's right. Where God tells me what's right. And I'm going to respect what's right in ways that the world can see. That's the way it reads. Verse 18, if possible, 
so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Some of you have heard me teach about this before. That doesn't mean that you're going to be nice to him and that'll make him miserable. (laughs) So I'll explain this one more time for those who haven't heard it. In the ancient Near East, they didn't have a lot of wood. So they couldn't, every household couldn't keep a fire going all night. And so what would happen is they would designate one person, probably in a rotation, who would keep a fire going all night for the whole village. In the morning, he would build it up, let it burn down to coals. He would put coals then in a, in a clay pot, and he'd take a piece of wood, put it on his head, and on top of, the, of, of, his, of that, that, that piece of wood, he would, he would put that clay pot. And then he would go through the village with a pair of tongs, giving burning coals to each of the households so they could start their cook fires in the morning. What he's referring to here is if we do good to our enemies, we make them spreaders of warmth. That's what we're called to do. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So this foundational value the Lord poured into me, and it's been a passion all along, applies to one another. It applies to the outsider, how we live together. It's why as a pastor I've always given so much grace to messy people. And I've been criticized for that. It's why in this church, a staff member can screw up to such a degree that another ministry would fire him or her. But I've chosen to stand by and fight for mercy until the price, and I'll, listen, I'll fight for mercy until the price in damage to the flock is too high. And so yes, I've fired a couple of people through the years. But there's some others that have worked with us through the years that made some pretty bad mistakes. They could get up here and testify to you. And I didn't fire them, and we worked with them. We gave grace, and they grew to be towering paragons of mercy ministry. And I'm proud of them. That's who we are. And it's who we're gonna be. Compassion is why we invested in a full-time staff member for mission and community outreach all those years ago when we really didn't have the money for it and no other church our size has that. If you did it to one of the least of these, you did it unto me. That's why we did that. It's why we have a large, significant counseling department. It's mercy, it's grace, it's compassion, it's love. When we started out, I... When we started out, I thought radical mercy, love, and acceptance would be a popular goal. But I found out that it wasn't for a lot of people. Not among believers. People came into this church interpreting our value for compassion as mercy for me, but protection from them. Early staff members fought me. And they undermined me behind my back for the mercy I chose to extend to people that they didn't think were worthy of mercy and compassion. People called me a fool. Other pastors called me a fool for loving certain people and giving them grace and position. I'm still giving grace and position, and I will not stop. Sometimes I crossed over into what I would call fleshly compassion but I'm getting better at speaking the truth in love when it needs to be spoken. Overall, I want to redeem people, not crucify them. I've prayed long and hard for a people that would share my dream of a church of radical mercy like Jesus hungered for and like Paul described, and I believe that people's sitting before me today and you're proving me right. Fourth thing the Lord poured into me was people. People. And the way we put that is we want to encourage and release people into the ministries that they were divinely created for. We want to see into people's hearts as a people and we want to call out what God has put there. Because we believe that each of us has a destiny given by God. Each of us has a reason for which you were born. And part of my job and the job of the church is to give you the room to find it, seek it, own it, and develop it. 
Sometimes that's a little costly. <laughs> you know, we have two other good worship leaders besides me. But there are times I'm, I'm, I'm sitting out there thinking, boy, I'd do it different. I'd, I would do it just something else. Which I <laughs> and I have to give them freedom to be them. That's our value. And it comes out great, doesn't it? <laughs> it's anointed. It's anointed. <laughs> We're going to give the freedom to people to develop their ministries Amen. in their way, within the bounds of our values. I reserve the right to speak into it all. And I do. <laughs> and I will. <laughs> But we want to challenge you to grow, and we want to challenge you to stretch, and we want to challenge you to try. We want to challenge you to get a vision for what God wants you to do, and if you can't find a ministry of the church already doing it that you can join with, we'll help you create it. Come talk to us. We want to treat every individual, no matter how messy they are, and no matter how offensive or deserving of contempt, we want to treat them with respect and with courtesy, and we want to do it with consistency. We want to restore what's broken. Doesn't make any difference. Doesn't make any difference what area of life that might include. Work, marriage, fatherhood, motherhood, sexuality, bodily illness. You know, you're not just a receiver of mercy, you're a dispenser of it, if Jesus called you. You're a conduit for the delivery of love and mercy from Jesus to people whatever it is that you're called to do. We're talking about doing that from Jesus through you to those who need it, those who would be strengthened by it. And so we're here to give people a chance. There was a time when I thought, hey, we're the church of the second chance. <laughs> we're here to give people a chance. We won't throw you away if you fail. It's not so much about whether you fail as it is about how we pastor that and what you've learned in the process of trying. That's mercy. It's not about your performance. It's about your heart. It's about whether you're learning to serve in the way God has called you to serve. People come in and say, boy, you know, I really slipped. I sinned. Should I step down from ministry? So I'm not so interested in the sin you committed as I am with what did you learn? And where's your heart? It's never life sucks, then you die. It's serve God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. Do it with joy and wonder and then go home to him in victory at the end. 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. This is the Apostle Paul. He's facing the end of his life and this is what he says. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his coming. Here's number five. Relationship and ministries that encourage relationship. This is what the Lord poured into me 27 years ago. That includes relationships in the church, it includes relationships outside the church, relationships in families. God is a relational God. Our culture teaches us isolation, and it's a lie. We are the loneliest nation of people on the planet right now. We're so isolated. We're so relationally broken, we can't even manage to stay married, not even in the church. The divorce rate in, in the evangelical Bible-believing church is actually one-tenth of a point higher than in the world the last time I looked. And yet nearly all the images in the Bible that have to do with the kingdom of God are relational. Most of the New Testament, I mean, seriously, read it cover to cover. Most of the New Testament is really not so much doctrinal teaching not, not so much telling us what to believe theologically. That's an important component. That's true. But it's relational. It's calling people together. 
telling them how to love on the basis of what they believe, how to reconcile with one another because Jesus has given us the ministry of reconciliation. It's how to, how to walk together because Jesus and the Father are one and he prayed that we would be one as they are one. Romans 12 that we read just a little bit ago is all about relationship. And so we call you urgently, not just to the Sunday worship experience. We call you to be involved in some kind of a smaller group, laboring together for the kingdom of God, praying together, sharing together on a regular basis. And it could be the men's meeting. It can be the women's meeting. It's going to happen tomorrow. It can be the team that goes out every week with Dave Grasso to, to reach the neighborhood and to reach sometimes downtown. It can be working with the mission team. It can be coming to, it can be part of the, the prayer groups. It can be part of a team working with children, part of this team up here that, that, that leads worship, but get involved relationally. Relational God. See, if you don't grow in relationship, then you haven't really gotten the point of what being a Christian is all about. I'll never forget Beth and me ministering in Australia. And we're sitting down with these Australians for a long afternoon. And all they're doing is talking with one another and stuff. And they said to us, you Yanks, <laughs> you just don't understand what we're doing. You think you always got to be doing something. And what you don't understand is we're doing relationship. And I never forgot it. That's why we will never open a prayer meeting in this church without taking time for relationship. You come before the Lord in agreement, you start with relationship. Two or more agree is touching anything, right? Well, you got to agree first. That's relationship. John 15, 12 and 13. This is my commandment that you love one another. It's a relational word. Just as I have loved you, greater love has no one than this that one day lay down his life for his friends. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Man, you gotta do that in relationship. Not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I want to tell you, being a Sunday only Christian is kind of like being married and coming home only when you want sex. Yeah, some of you got that. That's not really very satisfying. That's not the substance of relationship. See, Sunday is just a piece. It's an important piece, but it's just a piece of the fullness of the blessing that God wants for us. It costs sometimes. It's not always a party, but in the end, it's worth it because the love that Jesus pours out you know, through us for one another is wonderful, especially the love that you paid for with effort and forgiveness and mercy. And so 27 years ago, I envisioned a people who would love to be together like the church in Acts 2, breaking bread from house to house, worshiping day by day in the temple together, sacrificing to support one another when somebody got into trouble financially or somebody had a need. That's what I hungered for. It's what I still hunger for because it reflects the heart of Jesus. Ephesians 5, bride. The, you know, the Ephesians 5, the bride without spot or wrinkle. That's what it is. I want to give Jesus a bride without spot or wrinkle. And here's number six. Evangelism in ways that are culturally appropriate, sensitive toward people, and demonstrably effective. Compassion and mercy have to extend to the outsider as well, or we stagnate and we die. You know, in a culture where the church, we live in a culture where the church has a reputation for hatred and judgment. The only workable ways to win others to Jesus have to be radical compassion and mercy. And my heart, I've got to tell you, my heart is more blessed than I can say that we have a solid team of people going out every week to touch the world outside, door to door, just loving people, not coming to the door and handing them a tract. Here, read this, you know, get this doctrine straight, but coming to the door and saying, how can we help you? Isn't that what you guys do? How can we help you? Is there something we can pray for for you? Yeah. We're here for you. 
Radical compassion and mercy. I'm just blessed. Going to the homeless, touching people wherever people can be found. People have come to know Jesus through our food bank. Any agency can distribute food. When they come to us, we get to touch them with Jesus. Again, it's love, it's mercy, it's serving people in the heart and love of Jesus. Isaiah 58, 10. If you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like midday. You know, if one of our values is relationship, it has to extend to the poor and the messy and the afflicted. You know, people have come to know Jesus through our counseling department as we've helped put lives together. I want to see more of that. That's the heart of who we are. You know, you can't just plug your nose and offer help to hurting people at arm's length. You've got to engage them. You've got to give yourself. That's why Isaiah 58 said, take the homeless poor into the home. Oh, wow. Try that one out. I had to realize some time ago that as a pastor, I'm kind of locked up in the church. I had to realize... I haven't had an unbelieving friend since my college roommate in 1973 who was Jewish. I've been locked up in the church too long serving the needs of people who are already Christian. It's true. And that's too bad. I'm kind of stuck here. I maintain the home while others gather them in. That's, that's my job. I accept that. That's okay. But I'm trying to train myself to be more aware of people around me when I'm out in the world. It's an awareness that you have to build into yourself. When I'm out in public now, I'm constantly asking the Lord if there's some kind of loving, encouraging, prophetic word I'm supposed to share with a stranger. Show me here. You know, I'm here. I'm ready. And it's as simple, you know, people think it's really complicated. I'm going to tell you, it's as simple as giving up my place in line at the grocery store to the older woman in front of me. And you find out she's so surprised, she'll go out of her way to thank you. And then you have a conversation. Or being aware of the person next to me on an airplane. That's, boy, what a, you know, that, that's a captive audience. And all you have to do is start expressing an, an interest in their life. I'll never forget one flight I was on. I started talking with this girl. It turned out that her children had been taken from her. She only got to visit them every now and again. She flies all over the country for her business. And she wanted to know if maybe she needed to move back to the town where her children were because she didn't have custody of them. And all of a sudden, I'm giving her a prophetic word, saying, this is what God's asking you to do. And, she, you know, and she's beginning to cry. It's love, it's mercy, it's service, it's grace. Wherever we go in, all we do, it'll open doors and it'll work. Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even the remotest parts of the earth. I've often thought this, if each one of us would bring in just one person in this way in a whole year, just one, we'd grow 100% as a body of Christ every year. And there'd be a party in heaven over every one of them. See, these are the goals. These are the values of our church. I'll add one other that wasn't part of the six because it was so deep in my DNA. It's my family legacy. It's what my father taught all of his life. And it's Malachi 4, 5, and 6. The hearts of the fathers restored to the children and the children to the fathers. Always intended that we would be an intergenerational church where the young and the old would dance together. They would worship together. They would minister together. And there'd be fathers and mothers in Christ raised up to father and mother, a fatherless, motherless generation. That one the enemy has attacked with a ferocity, but I will not surrender it. I will not. And that's why at a time when any other pastor would have been cutting back expenses and, and, and cutting programs in order because... There was a risk going on because half of us went out to plant a church. That's why I said, I'm not backing up and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not cutting back. I'm moving forward and we hired that wonderful young man over there. <laughs> to come and be our youth pastor because we're gonna be, we're gonna be that church, that Malachi 4, 5, and 6 church. 
so that the Lord will not come and smite the land with a curse. So those are the goals and values of our church. I've given my life to this. It's worth giving your life to this. I believe there are people here who know themselves called to give their lives and their devotion to these values and these goals. They're Jesus' goals after all. They're his heart. And what I want to call us to do today is rededicate ourselves to this vision and these values. I'll throw one other thing out. I got the weirdest email a couple weeks ago. The Lord had, or last week actually, the Lord had been speaking to me that there were people around the country who the Lord was calling to come here and help us in this battle, to move here from other parts of the country. I got an email from a woman living in Louisiana. She says, within 30 days, I'm moving here with my 19-year-old daughter to be part of your church. I got an email yesterday. She says, I'm part of a group that are moving to Denver. And I thought, I don't know if that whole group's coming to our church, but I want to tell you something's happening. Okay, something's happening. And we need to be ready for it. We need to be alive, awake, and alert because that's a responsibility, people. And so what I'm crying for today is can we rededicate ourselves to this vision and these values? Seriously speaking. Seriously speaking. And I feel like the way that we should finish this before we do our usual ministry time is I need somebody to come up here and pray with some passion, rededicating us as a flock. And anybody who wants to come stand with whoever's going to pray can come and do that. Oh, my Lord, breathe on me. Touch my eyes and make me see. Wake me, Lord. From my sleep to hear you.